Good evening, and welcome to tonight's lecture by Zygmunt Plotter, Professor of Law and Director of the Land and Environmental Law Program at the Boston College School of Law. My name is Noelle Nettisol, and it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Economics Department at Reed College. Tonight's lecture is supported by the Walter J. Krauss Lecture Fund and is co-sponsored by the Audubon Society of Portland and the Animal Law Journal at Lewis and Clark College. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act, which is one of the United States' strongest environmental laws. This statute has been instrumental in halting and reversing the decline of both iconic and unheralded species alike, and is a driving force in ongoing efforts to restore the Northwest's ancient forests and once teeming salmon runs. TVA v. Hill still stands as an important milestone in the ESA's four decades of conservation, and tonight's lecturer, Professor Sigmund, was at the center of this case. Professor Sigmund's distinguished career includes serving on seven law faculties, fired from only one, for somewhat obvious reasons, chairing the State of Alaska Oil Spill Commission's Legal Research Task Force, consulting on the Deepwater Blowout, and authoring new, numerous articles on environmental law. The structure of tonight's uh, lecture, Professor Zygmunt will speak for about 40 minutes, and then he will take questions and hopefully have insightful answers. So please join me in welcoming Professor Zygmunt. Thank you. This way I can pretend to start out formally behind Marty, am I on? Yes. Thank you. Um, but I probably will spend most of my time sitting on, on the table. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Noella, for, for arranging so much to bring me here. Um, I have worked in the past with Lewis and Clark, some wonderful colleagues there, but I've never been to read before. Uh, although there are wonderful readies all over the place, so I have admired you from a distance, those of you from here. And Portland Audubon, um, actually, let's see if this works, uh, has been one of the most amazing Audubon groups uh, in, in the country. Uh, this is an endangered species case. The God Committee, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so you guys... Uh, in the Portland Audubon Society, uh, uncovered uh, a scandal in the way that committee had been politically wired. Uh, and as a result, the God Committee that we'll talk about later uh, is credible in large part, not because of what I did, but because of what you did. Marty, do I have to stand in one place or? or... Marvelous. Um, okay, so um, my students and I have the privilege and, and the curse of having this little fish uh, fall into our lives. Um, this is Exhibit 12 at trial. We'll, we'll talk about that. Not, not the ruler, but the other part of it. Um, and, and that fish uh, shaped six years of my life and got me fired. Uh, but it turns out that it became an icon in, in our society. This was three decades ago. But I'm hoping that is, this evening we can figure out that it wasn't ancient history. It's still with us, uh, although it's with us as an example. Is this OK? Yeah. You know, we have a technical perfectionist back there, and I want to make sure that he's happy with the sound. Um, but, but the deal is that it became the stupid little fish versus the gigantic hydroelectric dam. And, and many of you uh, who were around during that decade know it was one of the three most covered environmental stories of that decade. Uh, but even those of you who supported the fish thought that it was a juxtaposition, that on balance really was questionable, a gigantic uh, hydroelectric dam. Uh, and these guys uh, <laughs> still talk about the snail darter uh, when they talk about the Endangered Species Act, which, by the way, has not been reauthorized by Congress since, do you know when? 1992. 
it's one of those wonderful statutes, a pioneering statute, the first in the world to approach endangered species with, with any sense of mandate. And it's hanging by its fingertips. Every year, we beg for a continuing resolution. Uh, and grudgingly, it's given, but I can promise you, the Endangered Species Act is not going to be reauthorized in this Congress. And I can probably promise you it's not going to be reauthorized in the next Congress. And part of my guilt is that that's because our case, imagine if it were a whooping crane or, or a, a polar bear, is so easily marginalized, trivialized, satanized. Um, so this is the tiny little fish versus the gigantic hydroelectric dam. And this, even, even those of you who are environmentalists who probably sympathized, this is the way you thought of it. Uh, and, and immediately when we got our injunction in the Sixth Circuit and then in the Supreme Court, uh, my students and I thought that the world would come and look into the facts of the case and instead you can see, now Miss Peach I think is no longer with us, but do, do you see the, 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 the backlash was extraordinary because the cliche uh, was so foolish, the most extreme environmental case uh, ever. But it continues in recently, uh, so, so, so and, and, and Ann Coulter, anti-biblical, anti-Torah, anti-Christian. She's a very inclusive lady. Uh, and I don't know what homosocialism is, but I take it it, it was not uh, an applause for our efforts. So these are comments about people who brought the snail darter case, but by extension, all of you. Uh, I assume that most of you are here uh, with some kind of environmental protection I, background. Oh, Sean Hannity, fringe lunatics. Uh, and, and if you look at it, it, it's gone beyond endangered species. The same people who struggle to say the snail darter, bless the pill and defend abortion. If you put in abortion and snail darter, you'll find, you know, what do we care about? People or, and anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, Roger Ailes, who, who uh, you know, is the one who every morning determines what spin uh, Fox News is going to give, uh, doesn't like us. Uh, but, but look at this. It's gone beyond endangered species. It's even gone beyond uh, environmental regulation. Uh, any and every Every government agency and bureaucrat, for any and every reason, is going to try to get rid of citizens' private property. The snail darter has sort of become the shorthand for overregulation in this country. And, and the trouble is, it's really easy to do that if you frame it the way it was framed. And you know, George Lakoff, once you frame something, the framing continues and continues. Uh, we'll talk about this later, but I tried, I spoke with more than 120 reporters, some of them more than 20 times, and we never got a national story that told the story you're about to see. But I think it's important that you see the real story because the snail darter icon of foolishness is still around and it still star tars you with, with, with a, 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 a image of foolishness. Um, but so this is the story. Um, this is the Little Tennessee River. Uh, the last 33 miles of flowing river uh, an incredible farmland. Behind us, 10 miles, are the Smokies. Anybody here ever go to the Smokies? Yeah, it's, it's the nation's most populous, uh, most, most visited, 10 million plus people a, a year. Uh, but when you think of dam, you think of a valley with a lot of water. 
th this is, is, is a fairly <laughs> uh, flat valley, uh, as you can see, and we'll talk more about it. The darter uh, had its major shoal there, uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit too. And then there's the little dam down at the end, but the real story I think that I tried desperately to get across and, and, and didn't do a very good job of uh, was the human impact. This is environmental justice as well as endangered species. Uh, a community, quite low income, uh, some of them eight uh, generations there on the land. Um, what do I do next? Uh, I put this together last night, so I can't remember what was there. All right, oops. Marty, this has a hair trigger. Well, if you can blink when I go, oh, there we go. So, so incredibly historic. Uh, you, you have uh, the enemy mountains were the Smokies because whites and, and other Indians came over the mountains. The Cherokee towns, uh, Chota uh, was the Jerusalem of the Cherokees. Tanafi, do you see a Tennessee? This map was done in 1762. Toqua had a number of just huge pyramid mounds. Uh, and Fort Loudoun, oh, Tuskegee was where Sequoia was born. Uh, Fort Loudoun was built uh, by the uh, Cherokee and the British to keep the French and the Indians away. Really an amazing place. And, and Mialquo, Great Island, uh, the archaeologists had found the only place in the United States that had 10,000 years of continuous human habitation. Uh, incredibly rich soil, incredibly rich river, uh, and, and, and the Russell Cave National Monument has 10,000 years, but it was just used as a shelter. Uh, the field, I grew up uh, plowing stones in the northern Appalachians. Down here, this soil was unbelievable. The only stones you would see was, you know, after plowing in a rain, you would see potsherds and, 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 and arrowheads. Uh, grade, U.S. DA grade one and two down 16, 17 feet. And, and the river, uh, unbelievable fishing. Uh, it comes limestone out of the Smokies and therefore has just the right kind of alkalinity. Um, this is the Smokies, um, and, and this was the last stretch of flowing uh, uh, high-quality river left in the region. Each of these circles is what, do you guess? Dams, dams. There were 24 uh, major dams within 50 miles of, of this project. Uh, and as you can see, when I went down to Tennessee, I'm sorry, this is fuzzy, we can't figure out why, there weren't enough dams yet in, in uh, TVA. They did a, a, a catalog in 1936 uh, of 68 dam sites, and they built them all, except this is the last 33 miles, uh, and they decided we must uh, uh, finish it because uh, if you're a bureaucrat, a rolling stone gathers momentum. Uh, the, the darter uh, used to live, apparently, in most of this area here, but got eliminated one by one by one by what? Dams. That the number one cause of, of extinction is what? Shooting or poisoning? No, right? It, habitat disruption, right? So, so, and, and so that's a legal point that I tried to get across in the Supreme Court. Uh, but about, okay, so here's, here's your image of the dam, right? Uh, this is a TVA dam uh, generating electricity, and that's the Teleco Dam. Uh, a tiny little pipsqueak of a dam. Uh, I stood at the bottom, I tried to figure out how do I tell Congress uh, that this is a stupid little dam. Uh, and, and so I, had a, I threw a pebble and I had a student catch the pebble and I took it into Congress and I said, it's a small dam, it has no generators. It's, it's, I threw this pebble over it and look at this arm. Uh, and, and they got the idea. Um, but the image was always of a huge dam. Um, the, this is the megalomaniac, excuse me, this is the, the chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, Red Wagner, who was Mr. TVA. He was the most powerful politician in the seven state region. Governors would, well, the governor of Tennessee said, please don't do this project. And, and Red Wagner said, you don't understand what your state needs. Uh, so, but he said to his people, all right, we're going to build this dam here. By the way, this is the backup of the dam downstream. That's the Watts Bar Dam. Right here is the Fort Loudoun Dam, and it goes back up about 50 miles. And he said, all right, we can't justify it for power. We can't justify it uh, for, for flood control. 
On Friday the 13th, 1959, they all came together and he said, bring your imagination. What kinds of reasons can we find for building a project that otherwise wouldn't be justified? Uh, and so they came up with this idea. All right, the black that you see there, that's the, not the river, that's the lake that they were uh, uh, planning on impounding. Uh, but in order to justify it, they said, number one, by the way, this by eliminating the last best incredible trout fishing, uh, float fishing, and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and families would float down this river and stop on an island and look for arrowheads. And, and we will increase recreation by a million and a quarter a year. Uh, plus, we will condemn 60 square miles, 330 family farms, most of them being condemned at $330 an acre, that was the average, plus 5,000 bucks for a house and 6,000 bucks for, for, for a barn. And we'll resell it. Boeing, which had just lost the SST, will come in and build Timber Lake, a model city, and TVA, this guy kept saying again and again, 50,000 residents, 26,000 jobs. If you environmentalists care about poor people, you will back off and let us build this. Of course, Boeing looked at it and said, this is economically ridiculous and left. But he continued to say, 50,000 people will come to live. This is the center of Timberlake, right? Uh, 26,000 jobs. Uh, and, and you know, when you have that kind of power, it's like the Asimoglu extractive elites. You not only control uh, money and politicians, but you control the media. Uh, and there was no way for, for the farmers who were fighting desperately to get the story of the reality of this project across. It's not a hydroelectric dam. It's tiny. It's being justified by a model city which will never happen. Condemnation of 330 family farms, most of them for resale uh, and recreation. Uh, this is Asa uh, uh, and, and Nell McCall. They had a farm of 100 acres. Only two acres would, would be flooded by an impoundment, uh, but uh, all of it was being taken because uh, they were told this is justifying the project as producing land development. Um, the as you can see, our Smoky Mountains are way in the distance, so this is 33 miles of farmland, and, and you can see it's relatively flat. In order to, to make it an impoundment, they had to build coffer dams at a variety of places so that it didn't spill into the other dams on either side. Uh, but, but TVA was relentless. The farmers fought uh, and fought hard. Uh, they demanded an environmental impact statement. TVA said, we don't have to do an environmental impact statement because we're an emergency agency. We were created as an emergency agency. We don't have to obey federal law. What was the emergency for which TVA was created? The Great Depression, which had tapered off a little bit by the late 70s. Uh, but the lawyering of, of, of TVA within TVA land was incredibly powerful. And so the local judges, and, and oh, that's a pretty good argument. They took it up on appeal and, and uh, uh, an injunction was issued. They had to do an environmental impact statement. But in, you know, the National Environmental Policy Act is procedural. It's not substantive. So you, if you catalog most of the bad things you're going to do uh, and talk about the alternatives, and he said, there's no alternative that will produce 50,000 people and 26,000 jobs, then the judges say, okay, we won't. Anyway, Jean always talked with her hand like this. Uh, and, and, and that's uh, Bob Blankenship, uh, who was the tribal chief of, of the Cherokee. A number of the Cherokee had been driven out by Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren. But the Kuala band that, that I represented ran up into the hills. And when Van Buren and Jackson died, they came down and then went over to North Carolina. Uh, although the medicine men, Amanit Sequoia and Lloyd Sequoia, were great, great, great grandchildren. Of, they were medicine men, and they would come in to gather medicine uh, uh, from the valley. And the white farmers were fine with that. I don't know, how are we doing for time? So, so all right, I'm fishing in the river. And my buddy says, do you see what you're walking on? I say, oh yeah, it's a big log. And, and he says, yeah, I'm on one too. Great big V's stuck in the bottom of the river. And, and some stones too. Coming down and then there's an opening here. What is it? Shallow river, flowing river, what is it? 
It's a fish trap. So you have the women and children whacking the water and then the guys at the end with a spear. This is during the Nixon administration. I'm standing on a Cherokee uh, fish trap that was built probably in the 1700s, right? Uh, or once, have you ever been on water when it's foggy and you know how sound really carries and carries but you don't know where it's coming from? So I'm there fishing and there's this splash. I said, what? what's that? And, 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 and again, la, 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 splash, and my buddy's, oh, that's a Cherokee going to water. <laughs> what? The, I mean, this was in the 1970s, coming over, and apparently you gather water and then you splash in the river. The ululation is, is an atavistic thing around the world. In Africa, I, I would hear when Haile Selassie came, la, 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 exactly the same thing, not Cherokee. Uh, but, but a spooky place, a beautiful place, and much loved, and the farmers uh, uh, deeply bound into their land, but nothing happened. Uh, they came up, by the way, when you're an environmentalist, you look at the official benefits and you say, oh my God, what are they, exaggerated or, or minimized? Phew. The cost, Phew. but the third part is alternatives. You've got to come up with better alternatives. And what they said is, look, let us stay on our farms, and we can have an industrial site there if you want it, and residential here. But this red light a line coming from I-75, which goes north from Florida to, to Chicago uh, to, to Detroit, and this from the Atlantic to, to, to the Pacific, tourism coming up. Those of you who went to the Smokies, you went in probably through commercial splashes in Gatlinburg up here. Dolly Parton, uh, uh, what does she call herself? Dolly, Dolly Land or something. Right, and uh, Dinosaur World, or, or the only hula hula porpoise show in the Appalachians, right? Uh, whereas Boyd Everson, the, the superintendent of the Great Smokies Mountains National Park, said, this is fantastic. Bring people in through here. We can control the entry so that there isn't the commercial splash. Horseback riding, which is hurting the park, can be here. But can, and what are each of those circles, do you suppose? No, not dams. Those are historical sites, both the ancient ones plus Fort Loudon right there, and, and, and the, the villages and the farmers said, we're delighted to have tourism come up through here. If people just got off the interstate, one-tenth of one percent, we figured it was going to be in the millions every year. Uh, and the cost of it was just the cost of re-signage. Uh, so it made too much sense, and of course, I could not get any newspaper to publish this map. I put it in a Supreme Court brief, um, but they would not pick up because stupid little fish, gigantic dam, that's the story. And if you talk about, hey, the alternatives are far better, and the project itself is going to destroy far more than it could ever create, it's getting too complicated. Uh, a British reporter told me, editors have to sell papers. It's infotainment. What we are told to do is simplify, then exaggerate. Um, so, so, and, and so the, the, the case was lost. Ultimately, the impact statement was accepted. This is David Etnire, uh, a world expert on perch. Uh, this is Wayne Etnire, his PhD student. This is Buck, the field manager. Uh, <laughs> And they were out doing a final census of the river. And David, you see how shallow it is, and they're, they're halfway across. He had on a snorkel, and he was going on, and he saw this little fish, and he reached out with his hands, and he stood up, and he said, guys, come around here. Actually, first of all, went up onto a, a shoal so he wouldn't lose it. He said, I've never seen this fish. It's a little perch, and I've never seen it before. And he went over, and Bill Cottrell was there, a farmer with his dog, dog, and, and, and he said, Bill, I think this is an endangered species. I think this can save your farm. Um, but the thing is, biologists don't know what to do with that. So, so I mean, they, they measured it. They, did, they sent a, a, a note up to Washington. But nothing happened except they drank beer, a lot of it. And I had a student who drank beer, a lot of it. Uh, and he happened.
be drinking beer, a lot of it, with these guys when I assigned a, a term paper. I, I assigned both an exam and uh, uh, a, sh a very short exam and a short paper. And he came in and he said, you know, I, I, I'm in your course. Um, I, I was drinking with some fish biologists and they, they found an endangered species in the middle of the TVA Teltico Dam project. Do you think that's enough for 10 pages? <laughs> and I, <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> um, so, so this is section seven of the Endangered Species Act. I don't like to do PowerPoints that have text, but this is primary text, right? So, so look at it, it's like 129 words. I know the guys who wrote this. What if they had called this in the bill that went to Congress? Uh, prevention of destructive federal projects, <laughs> right? Instead, interagency cooperation. I mean, how, how <laughs> all right. So, so, so and, and, but if you're a lawyer, you're looking for words which create a formula, we call it a cause of action, that can produce a remedy. And the remedy we wanted, well, was capital punishment for, for Red Wagner, but uh, <laughs> it, it turns out that, that if you take a pencil and go like this, the judge shall review other programs, all right, the lobbyist who's checking this out is already asleep, right? All right, what do you underline? Are you under all federal departments and agencies, you want to underline that? You need a subject, right, for your sentence. Yeah, all, all federal, and remember, NEPA, environmental impact statements, had strength because that snake in the grass that the goddamn environmental slipped into NEPA, right, uh, applied to all federal agencies, right? Shall, should we, what, shall, should we underline that? What if it said may? It says shall, all right? Shall what? Dot, 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 dot. Lots of camouflaged words. Dot, 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 dot. What's the next word you want to choose? Utilize. Oh, that's boring, though. Right? No, seriously, when you're starting out with a statute that has not been litigated, you have to make it as punchy as possible. So I, I was looking. By the way, it didn't have these little parentheses. Shall ensure, misspelled that actions <laughs> authorized, funded, or carried out, right? I think, that, I think that shall ensure that actions, what does that cover? It covers absolutely everything, right? So, so, all right, carried out, do what? Do not jeopardize. So that was the first count in, in my uh, complaint um, that, that we call it the jeopardy. And then the second, which didn't have a little parentheses, boy, if it had parentheses, it probably never would have passed. All right, but shall result in the destruction or modification of habitat of such species, which is critical habitat. Do you see how that was hidden by those hypocrites? And then the hypocrites who would use that, knowing that most members of Congress, eight members of Congress knew that was there, and they didn't talk about it except they put into the reports that this will stop projects if they violate uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, if, if they, they jeopardize uh, the species or harm. Or which of those two cause of actions is going to be easier to prove? Knowing that the federal agency backed up by the corporations that are working with it, as, as usually happens in, in our dipolar system, uh, they're going to come at you with everything. All kinds of experts, right? Which is going to be easier to prove? Jeopardy or destruction or modification of habitat? Yeah, number two, absolutely. Uh, we went with both and ultimately we're prevailed. But, but you see, I tell students, you know, when you are working, brainstorm it in different ways and think of how you're going to be able to prove it, given the fact you don't have money. Uh, you don't have, anyway, so th those are the words. And that did it, like 28 words. Um, so we went to Fort Loudoun again. This, this, this is the fort. It was restored a little bit in the New Deal. And the farmers have been going there during the environmental impact statement litigation. And then they basically lost. They were heartbroken. And, and so we called uh, my student, Hank, uh, and I and said, we have another reason. Can you pull people together? And we got 30 people to come to Fort Loudoun for a potluck dinner. And we said, 
we got this fish. We've got, we, and I, I went through the, 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 the provision there in the law, and they were not interested. They said we were really hammered by that other litigation. TVA had been knocking down houses, had been uh, planting uh, rumors in the community. The IRS had, uh, Alfred David Scott audited three times within four years. The third time he said to the auditor, why are you doing this? Last time you gave me back 800 bucks. <laughs> and the auditor said, it's well known that you're against the TVA dam and TVA has strong friends in Washington. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, and and so, so you can understand why we wanted capital punishment. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I can't remember what comes next, but, but ultimately, Hank stood up. You know, me, I'm the professor, I'm the professional. They, they were not paying attention. He started reading from the environmental impact statement. Although the farmland uh, uh, has many acres, it's not of top quality. Wait, it's US at one and two, right? And, and the historical resources uh, are, are, the value is incalculable. And therefore, it's calculated as zero, right? Uh, and the, the river, you know, there's fishing, but it's not developed. Of course, the farmers wanted to develop the trout. They were getting people from Alabama, Georgia, from the Carolinas coming to this place because it was so un unbelievable. Uh, so they started getting angry, and there was a history guy, and he got angry. Uh, and that would be too painful turns to that will be painful. And as soon as you hear the change in the verb. So, so Asa, I don't know if I have, yeah, Asa takes off his hat and says, I've never heard of this fish before. By the way, he has coveralls and one is undone, right? And, and it's an itty bitty fish. But I say, if it can save our farms, we gotta try. And he passed the hat around, 29 bucks. Filing fee was 15 at that time, so I had a $14 litigation fund. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and we've kept that hat. That hat is now in an airproof uh, 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 archive. Uh. So, T-shirts, jaws had come out that year. So, so do, do you see how subtle it is? T-V-A, right, right? And, and we had these river days. Uh, I'm up on uh, an 18-wheeler flatbed uh, with, with a band playing. And on this day, um, we, the ATF came up and said, you gotta clear this, this demonstration. I said, why? Uh, there's been a bomb threat. And so I said to the crowd, uh, there's been a bomb threat. Uh, everybody who wants to go can go. One reporter left. Everybody else stayed. Uh, they found there were 12 sticks of dynamite in a bush right there. There's a little bush, you know, in, but there was no igniter cap. So, uh, but, but the point was TVA had made the local community turn against the farmers with this promise of jobs from the mythicals. I mean, it, it, you often have this problem. I, much of what this story uh, you will hear tonight, I'm sure, is familiar from your own experiences. Uh, and, and, and much, I suppose, will be a story that's unfamiliar. But, but the way that local people can be turned against their own long-term interest and characterized, I mean, me, I shouldn't have been wearing earth shoes and turtlenecks. Uh, but Hank, was a, a child of Tennessee, and, and still we were both identified as communists uh, or homo socialists or something. <laughs> um, whoops, so, uh, oh, no, oh, anyway. In between there, uh, so, so uh, I, I went up to Washington, and it's a long story, but we finally got it listed. Interior didn't want to, because the listing is the gateway, right? If it's not listed, then the law doesn't apply. And let me just say that the reason that I was able to get it listed is that Robert Leggett, a subcommittee chairman, had been caught committing adultery. And so he was not going to be reelected, and he wanted to leave a legacy, and so this was his legacy. <laughs> so we go to court, and um, this Judge Robert Taylor, uh, who, who looked at me and he said, would you stop this big dam for a red-eye cricket? I'm thinking, oh my goodness. I know there's some lawyers in the room. So he said, I'd like to know what that environmental impact statement 
uh, injunction cost, the, uh, cost the, the country. And in the back of the audience was the vice president of my university, who used to be a TVA lawyer. $16 million, Your Honor. And so when the judge wrote the opinion dismissing us, he said, the court was distressed to learn during the trial that $16 million had been lost to the public. But you get a feeling that Tennessee uh, is a banana republic. Uh, but I'm trying to think now, what did I put in next? So, but he admitted this as Exhibit 12 at trial. No way he should have admitted that as, as evidence. But it's a lithograph done by, we were selling those for 16 bucks. I kept talking about canary in the coal mine, right? Endangered species. And then remember that map of Tennessee. When a sensitive little species is showing harm, it probably means that there is harm to the public welfare as well. Uh, in those days, no reporter understood canary in the coal mine. Now, now they all do. Not because of us, but, but and, and not, this judge didn't. Uh, uh, he uh, was proof. At least this judge had a habit. At the end of a trial, you say, counsel, are, are you finished? Counsel, are you finished? And then he'd pull his opinion out and read it. So everything you'd said was irrelevant. Uh, but no, he went, oh, but this, during the trial, uh, just the week before, um, uh, Wayne, the guy with the bushy, uh, bushy hair, uh, had been down with an underwater video camera. And he said, uh, do you want me to bring in the movie? Because I saw spawning behavior. And, and I said, oh, yeah. And, and so he brought it in. Um, and I think I'm going to read some of my book, right? Uh, by the way, I've got handouts here that will tell you uh, Rush Limbaugh, homo, homo socialist, and things like that. Um, so, so this is page 99. Uh, I got a call from a guy with a blog. He said, I want to do a, a page 99 for you. I said, what's that? He said, Ford Maddox Ford said, if you ever want to know whether you should read a book, open to page 99, read it, and then you'll know. I thought, oh my goodness, what is my page 99? I was talking to people at dinner about this. And I thought, oh, it could be really boring. Ah, sex. <laughs> Starnes throws the two-minute underwater video sequence onto a courtroom screen. The lights dim, shaky images appear. This is the male laying here with the female immediately in front of him. Now, this is a bit of preliminary courtship. He's lying immediately behind her now, but she's a lot more worried about me being there than he is. He's much more intent on what he's doing. Chuckles echo through the courtroom as a hundred pairs of eyes peer intently into the watery boudoir. Now he's doing a tail-wagging movement to get her attention off of me. Now he's dropping down on her, coming over her left hind quarter here. A hush falls on the now onto her right quarter. You see him place his left pectoral fin in a crossover maneuver. And he's stroking the tail of her body with his pectoral, but uh, oops, she moves away again. Oh, now, now, coming up now is very heavy courtship again and possible spawning, I think. They're moving in unison. They go through the same maneuver. He's stroking her with his left pectoral, crossing over to her. Oh, now see, a violent quiver of her body. And he's waving his anal fin very violently. Now he's moving the sand around for egg deposit. Oh, okay, that's the end of it. You can turn on the lights. And, and the courtroom observers let out the collective breath they've been holding. But uh, Starnes explains that this isn't just an aquatic sex tape. It's not just a gambit to build empathy for the sweet little fish. The vi video vividly highlights the special, oh, in the background, the grass is going like this. What does that tell you? It's a current, and yet it's clear. It's not, the current is not stirring up mud. And do you see any mud? No, it's all this little gravel. And so he says, the eggs go into the gravel, but if there were an impoundment, the water wouldn't be moving, the mud would suffocate, the eggs would die. Um, so the judge dismisses us, but it turns out, I don't know what happens here. Oh yeah, I do. Um, he said, it'd be crazy to stop this very important project. He wouldn't let me put in any evidence uh, on the economics or the alternatives. Uh, but, but do you see, he said, so I dismiss it, although it's going to jeopardize the continued existence of the species and it's going to wipe out its critical habitat. <laughs> What's not to like? <laughs> and so the Sixth Circuit unanimously said, hello, uh, TVA's lawyers, just to give you another time. Your Honor, we're asking you to repeal the law so we can finish this dam. And one of the judges said, 
we don't normally do that. Uh, no, no, I'm asking you only, Your Honor, to amend it or rescind it as it applies to my project. And, and they start looking at each other. Uh, I argued brilliantly. I started like this, and the judge uh, uh, said, uh, counsel, counsel, before you skylark, build logically from the bottom. And uh, we all might not know where you're going. Going and he looks at the two dim bulbs on either side. Um, <laughs> but he's taking notes all through the, the, the argument. And ultimately, we got this unanimous judgment. And the clerk called me, and I said, you know, I'm really delighted. And she said, yeah. And I said, you know, and I saw that Judge McCree was taking notes on my argument. No, no, he wasn't taking notes on your argument. He was writing limerick. <laughs> Sing hail to the lowly sna snail darter the fish that would not be a martyr. He expletived the dam in those waters he swam. Can you think of a fish any? <laughs> My brilliant argument. <laughs> uh, so it goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Powell leans over and says, Mr. Platter, may I interrupt you? I, I mean, actually, that's the way he spoke. Uh, 
uh, apart from the biological interest, of which we do not challenge <laughs> but ignore, uh, what purpose is served of any by these little darters? Are they used for food? Are they so or what's that? That's the utilitarian human centric question, right? And clearly, it was not a friendly question. But it turns out, I tell my students, uh, oops, I tell my students, graphics, 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 Marty, what's wrong with this clicker? Well, what I'm trying to show you, ooh, is, yes. Um, I said, Your Honor, Exhibit 12 at trial would show you that this little fish is a vivid indicator of the shallow, clear, cool, flowing waters. But I've given a stack of those lithographs to the clerk of the US Supreme Court. And he jumps up and walks behind the justices <laughs> and gives them a picture. I say, that's at least one vote, right? You look into its little brown eyes. Uh, and, and so we got the judgment from Berger. How much time do we have? There's so many stories. Um, I think I better rush. Anyway, institutionalized caution. Do you, see, do you see, that is a beautiful environmental concept that instead of uh, short-term politics and profit, if indeed there is the likelihood of something irreparable, don't do it unless there is uh, a strong reason to do so. So the Iron Triangle went crazy. I, uh, there are iron triangles throughout government. This is the establishment. There's an iron triangle for highways. There's an iron triangle for, for mining. There's an iron triangle uh, for ranching. I heard that there was an iron triangle for timber cutting in the Northwest. So you have an agency, uh, you have the industry, and you have the, the uh, legislators who live on, on the money and the lobbying. That is the, this is the water projects uh, iron triangle. You know Red Wagner. Uh, and, and the industry that wanted to build the dam and, and theoretically wanted to do real estate development. And, and the southern, uh, that, that's Jamie Witten, the subcommittee chairman for water projects, and the pork committee, the money committee, which is the only committee that had regular hearings. Oh, and he's sitting with Bull Connor, those of you who remember that citizen from Selma, Alabama. Uh, and these guys formed, uh, and, and this is still a good coalition against the Endangered Species Act the National Endangered Species Act Reform Coalition. Uh, and the power represented in that list is really mind boggling. The fact that environmentalists have been able to hold on means that we really must be right. Uh, and these guys are the ones who kept arguing, we need good science, you hear that still. We need good economics, not this environmental frou-frou. Uh, but of course, the last thing they wanted was good science and good economics. Uh, this was written actually by a student of mine who never went to law school. Uh, she took the course uh, undergraduate at Michigan. She happened to be in Senator Wallop's office. He said, who's going to do a first draft? Congress, and this is what we argued for it, the Endangered Species Act can't be absolute. You have to have some kind of balancing mechanism. Uh, but we had you know, made concrete the strength of the Endangered Species Act, Section 7. So here. There shall be an Endangered Species Committee. This is the amendment to Section 7. It went from 129 words to more than 4,000. And the committee is made up of the secretaries, seven secretaries. I left one out. I left out transportation. Most of the secretaries representing iron triangles. They are to look at an economic review done by an expert economic team. And then know that, that, all right, by a vote of not less than five of its seven members, voting in person, in other words, no, de no, no, no agents, no, no representatives. I don't know of any other such institution in, in American government where cabinet secretaries themselves have to sit as judges uh, to, to an expert. Uh, and anyway, she wrote, uh, Patty McDonald said, you can grant an exemption allowing uh, jeopardy or destruction if on the record, after a full hearing, there are no reasonable and prudent alternatives, which of course is what we've been begging for. But there was no forum in modern politics that could go up against the pork barrel and do that. And now there was. Number two, she wrote, the benefits of such action clearly outweigh the alternatives. And of course, our alternatives tremendously outweighed the, the, the wistful benefits claimed for the, for, for the dam. 
and regional or national. So it went to the God Committee, and the God Committee had the economic uh, uh, review for about two and a half hours, and then there was silence. And then George Schultz said, uh, well, someone has to start. And, and, and he said, there you see, here's a project that's 95% complete and one takes just the cost of finishing it against the total project benefit and does it properly. It still doesn't pay, which says something about the original design. Everybody laughed like, ha, ha, ha. But the problem was, Supreme Court halts dam for little fish. Page one above the fold. Correct. Nowhere in most newspapers. Page 24, I think, in the Times. Uh, the, the Associated Press story was, uh, committee decides for fish over dam. Uh, Howard Baker furious, or something like that. Uh, so the media is important. I tell my students, never write a complaint unless it would sound good on the evening news. You know, you want to get across uh, the, the, the truth of what you're dealing with. Uh, anyway. Uh, Nothing happened for six months. I kept trying to get the farmers uh, uh, to be recognized with a right to their lands. Late at night, this guy s sneaks it on to uh, an appropriations bill. The, they stopped the reading at the word notwithstanding. 42 seconds, the pork committee was the only group in the, in the house uh, at that time. They all said, yay, it went on the appropriations bill. We tried and tried and tried to kill it. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we lost, uh, and Congress passed it. Um, on the media, I should note that every member of Congress, 535 of them, received a letter from Cecil Andrus, who was the chairman of the God Committee, saying, look, you've set up this committee. You wanted to have an intelligent inquisition when the project had 95% of its expenses paid. We found out that the river was far more valuable than, than, than the dam ever had been. And that's why we decided that this fish should continue in its natural habitat. Please don't vote for that override. But they all knew that America didn't know. And that made the difference. Uh, the Congress doesn't vote on the merits of bills unless the public knows what's going on. Uh, I, I don't think I'm being really dismal in saying that. It's just true, which means that we have to work harder. Um, so they ripped apart. This is the shoal. That's the breeding shoal of, of, of the snail darter. And they started their stripping there, and the mud went out over the shoal. Uh, this is Nellie. Asa had died. Uh, they came up. They, they loaded her stuff in the truck, what they wanted to. Uh, and then they bulldozed this into a hole in the ground and set it on fire. And Margaret, her daughter, went there la later that night. With, and, and, and Nell is pointing down. Uh, Asa had made the kitchen table, and the, the table legs were burning down in the hole. Um, the dam was finished. Uh, and for two years, nothing happened. Uh, and then TVA decided, I got a call from inside TVA, said, uh, they've decided they're going to make it into a regional toxic waste disposal facility. So I picked up the phone, I called the UPI reporter in the 24 hours, boom, it was dead. But that story was easy to tell, right? Toxic waste, beautiful river, hello. Um, uh, whereas explaining that story that I've just told you, do you see it's hard to do it uh, in, in, in short fashion? And another two years, uh, they started giving land away to a development company tied to uh, uh, Walmart. And so they started building these McMansions just around the, the, the perimeter of, of the lake. This, we're looking all the way across the lake. So you finish your golf game here, you go down into your putt-putt, you go out there. What the hell is that? <laughs> they left the silos. <laughs> here and there throughout the lake, you see silos poking up out of the shallow water. Um, and, and the water, by the way, what happens when you take fertile, cool water and you stop it flowing. What happens to temperature, up or down? And, and what happens to, to biodiversity, <laughs> down? Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, uh, you can't eat the fish. Oh, TVA also, they forgot to take the PCB out of the, the electric stuff that was in the valley, the, and, and so there are PCBs as well. What else? Oh, yeah. And uh, I guess this is the farmer's final salute to TVA. <laughs> All right, so, so you, you see the point. Uh, the, 
I, Jan Schlickman and I, did you see a civil action where John Travolta sued a chemical company? Uh, Jan Schlickman and I used to cry in our beer that we had done these cases and everybody thought we were idiots. We'd taken such stupid cases. And then Jonathan Haar wrote the book, A Civil Action. So I called uh, Jonathan and I said, you've got to write this story. I've got photos, I've got charts, I've got histories, I've got farmers with uh, all sorts of, and he said, no, 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 I wasn't there. You've got to write it, but write it like a movie. And it turns out for 30 years, I often wake up in the middle of the night, and Anne says, snail darter? I said, yeah, and she turns over and goes back to sleep. Uh, I think this is gonna help. But more to the point, it seems to me that an icon of foolishness that is used against Endangered Species Act, uh, which has been suffering attacks year after year. This isn't a 40-year celebration. This is a 40-year circling of defenses uh, that, that, that we're talking about. Uh, but the attack has gone beyond to environmentalism. Are you snail darter people? And if so, I mean, even Bobby Kennedy, who says he's the best environmental lawyer in America, uh, says, what sense did it make to try to save a little fish against a multi-million dollar hydroelectric dam uh, with friends like that? Uh, but now, so I brought you in on the story. The question is, it's your story now, too. Uh, and, and it might be nice to talk together about what can be done to share some of the lessons my students and I and the farmers and the fishermen and the history people learned. So we came very close. Oh, I got to tell that story. So, so Carter said, I'm going to veto this. Not only does it override the God Committee economic decision, but it overrides my Water Resources Council. Uh, unlike most politicians, Jimmy Carter, like Barack Obama, thought that rationality, in fact, had something to do with, with politics. And, and so he said, this, this is horrendous. Uh, and, and line up the, the votes so that at least one chamber can, can uphold my veto. We lined up votes in both chambers. And so I'm sitting, the night he is about to make the decision, I'm sitting in a little uh, environmental office in Washington. And the phone rings, Professor Plotter.
uh, will you take a call from the President of the United States? Okay. Uh, he was calling from Air Force One. And he said, Professor Plotter, I wanted you to know, I've just signed the override. I think it was the best thing for environmentalism in the United States. And I said, I don't know a single environmentalist who thinks you're right. And he said, well, I'm an environmentalist. And I, why is he calling me the schmeckle? Uh, the, the, but I, I think he, as a Christian, he wanted me to, to give him contrition, uh, kind of <laughs> absolution. Uh, but, but so I held him uh, and I said, you know, an environmentalist does not destroy the precedent that could be used to show good ecology is good economics. And he said, well, the subcommittee chairman is insisting on it. I'm thinking, who am I talking to? The subcommittee chairman is insisting on it. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I, I had my friend writing down my side of the conversation. I couldn't believe that this was happening. Uh, but he hung up finally. He said, uh, well, I've got to go now. Um, and so we brought, I don't know, no. Uh, I called the Cherokee and we brought a constitutional case. This overrode all, all statutes, right? But I told you the, the religious center. Uh, so they brought uh, a First Amendment Native American religion uh, claim. Uh, and Amanita Sequoia and jo uh, Lloyd had Cherokee depositions written to talk about, and then English translations about how they gathered medicine there and so on and so forth. We almost won in the Sixth Circuit, but we lost. And so the river died and Nellie and the other remaining farmers got kicked out. Um, but do you see, what's the first law of ecology? Everything's connected to everything else, right? So this is a story that goes not just endangered species, but it talks uh, about e resource economics. It talks about you know uh, history, the uh, environment, environmental justice, the media, the corridors of power in the agencies. And I mean, uh, we were blessed and cursed to have such an amazing case. And, and if I hadn't had such a case and such people, uh, obviously it would have gone nowhere. And it came that close. But America doesn't know about it. And now, when this reaches remainder tables all over America. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's the story, and you're part of it, as I say. Uh, what do you want to do with it? Do you have any questions? Yes. Oh, wait, we, we have uh, Allison and Ali with mics. All right. Uh, because. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Sure, you, you be the boss. So, Allie and Allison have microphones. There's and down here the woman in. Allie, down here. Hi. I was wondering, what's the status of the snail darter right now? Yeah. Um, we said, you know, we're going to don't move it from its natural uh, spawning beds until we've lost. And then we can try to transplant. It has a life cycle of about two or three years. And so it was transplanted in two other rivers. And the natural population that was there, that was left there, was 25,000. There are now about 25,000 in the two rivers. But they're on life support. Because those rivers, do, do you know in August how a river is much lower? and warmer and less oxygen, so that in August, TVA has to put in bubbles, 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 bubbles to keep it alive. And I don't know if the House of Representatives thinks that sequester is, but, but the serious point, it's, it, it's alive. Uh, but the best place for a species to survive is its natural habitat, its only remaining natural habitat. But the right wing says, see, it was not worth anything because we just transplanted it. And that's, that's, that's uh, I, I said, you know, that's like putting gas masks on, on the canary in the coal mine. <laughs> Got it? Actually, put that in the title of an article. <laughs> yes, hi. Um, I want to thank you very much for bringing this story to Portland, Oregon, which Thank is you so much for having me. Thank you so much for having me. 
leader in the environmental movement. Um, this very week, we had a, a good example of the Iron Triangle happening because um, there's a bill in Congress sponsored by our Senator Wyden. Um, I think he's Republican. And uh, to uh, sell off some forests and log some forests in the uh, Coast Range, Western Oregon. And um, so in Portland on, I think it was Tuesday, there was a, a rally. Um, and they were going to march to Senator Wyden's office um, to um, vote no on this. And actually, the bill was sponsored by our Democratic representative, DeFazio. And in the Oregonian, they reported DeFazio as calling the uh, environmentalists that want to save the forests and, you know, negotiate this issue, uh, called them radical. DeFazio calls the environmentalists of Oregon radical. And where we are choosing um, to save Western Oregon forests um, over job. So it's like wonderful that you told us this story of what we're dealing with right. today. Thank you. It's, it's a poisonous political atmosphere where even Barack Obama feels he has to look more central, which ends up being far right when we would have looked at it for, for a decade ago. But, but note, the emphasis, the, the importance of the media. It seems to me the government in the United States, uh, all five branches, has to be approached by citizens with the facts. All right, five branches, right? Legislative, judicial, executive, media, economy. <laughs> or plutocracy or extractive elite or whatever Asimoglu called them. That's right, that, uh, extractive elite. But, but the point is, the, the fifth one isn't going to budge. But if indeed we do it right, uh, we don't come across as radicals. We come across as people who are making sense. Look at the real benefits. Look at the real costs. Look at the real alternatives. Uh, and, and a clear cutting uh, along the coast is going to give a year or two of bounce to some community. But, but if you don't do that, then you talk about how the economy. In Oregon, it's no longer, timber is no longer the number one industry, isn't that right? Um, so you build on it. But, but when, when I started out, we never won a single battle. Uh, now, um, it's really disheartening, but there are a lot of laws, and there are a lot of citizens, and a lot of young people, and they're going into the congressional offices and into the agencies, and they often know what's going on and do the right thing. So I think... Well, if you can find Abbasio committing adultery, that would be helpful, too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Platter. That was a wonderful presentation. I had two questions. And one sort of a historical one, if you could put yourself back when you actually got the species listed. And I'm trying to contrast it with what happens now. Critical habitats are a really important part now of how we protect the species and the, and the process by which the Fish and Wildlife Service or National Marine Fisheries Service designates critical habitat is a big part. I'm assuming this was so early in the ESA process that they didn't exactly jump right on a critical habitat. It was the first time the critical so, habitat had been So you had to help them define the critical habitat that you were hoping to protect? Yeah. I mean, it's almost accidental the way yeah. it, it's there. And so I petitioned to have the fish listed as endangered and then to and, define and the, the habitat, habitat listed as critical. Wow. Wow. And I had really wonderful biologists to testify, for free, obviously. Uh, a cool. number of scientists won't testify because they don't want to look, uh, uh, they don't want to look biased. When you testify for industry, you're not biased. But when you testify for the public, you're, you're, you're biased. These guys, one of them risked his job to testify or to produce evidence. And, and it went through uh, against oh, TVA's expert. Uh, Edward Rainey, he had been in the court uh, case as well. He came in in an Armani, so, uh, well, the equivalent suit. Silver, and yes, he, he was the most eminent ichthyologist in America. And yes, he had 200, uh, and Etnire leans over and he says, this is the only ichthyologist who's ever become a millionaire as an ichthyologist. <laughs> and, and so uh, 
TVA lawyer says, and isn't it true that this little fish will flourish in a reservoir? And he says, yes, there'll be much more water for it to swim around in. <laughs> and I said, how could he say that? And Etnar said, in the business, we call these guys biostitutes. Um, but we had good biologists, and the Department of Interior had good biologists who, against the political pressure, pinned it down. And also, they knew that we were going to litigate against them, plus the adulterer threatened to hold hearings if they didn't list the critical habitat. So, so my second question. If the, I've worked on the Endangered Species Act for a lot of years, not nearly as many as you, but you've been a hero as I've watched and followed Thank this. Thank you. And so here's my question. Are you actually not a bit surprised how unsuccessful people have been at using the approach of going after legislation to exempt, oh, just exempt my project from consideration. I mean, I almost think it's amazing that it's worked as well as it has and that it hasn't been more often challenged in spite of some incredibly reactive and reactionary politics and, and loathing and it's a great fundraiser for the right to, to overturn the Endangered Species Act. But by God, we still follow it. Yeah. And it's and you can't. Although it's follow. hanging by his fingernails. Yeah, but it but it's hanging. It's not but, falling. And and also the National Environmental Policy Act again.
uh, will you take a call from the President of the United States? Okay. Uh, he was calling from Air Force One. And he said, Professor Plotter, I wanted you to know, I've just signed the override. I think it was the best thing for environmentalism in the United States. And I said, I don't know a single environmentalist who thinks you're right. And he said, well, I'm an environmentalist. And I, why is he calling me the schmeckle? Uh, the, 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 but I, I think he's, as a Christian, he wanted me to, to give him contrition, uh, kind of <laughs> absolution. Uh, but, but So I held him, uh, and I said, you know, an environmentalist does not destroy the precedent that could be used to show good ecology is good economics. And he said, well, the subcommittee chairman is insisting on it. I'm thinking, who am I talking to? <laughs> the subcommittee chairman is insisting on it. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I, I had my friend writing down my side of the conversation. I couldn't believe that this was happening. Uh, but he hung up finally. He said, uh, well, I've got to go now. Um, and so we brought, I don't know, no. Uh, I called the Cherokee and we brought a constitutional case. This overrode all, all statutes, right? But I told you the, the religious center. Uh, so they brought uh, a First Amendment Native American religion uh, claim. Uh, and Amanita Sequoia and jo uh, Lloyd had Cherokee depositions written to talk about, and then English translations about how they gathered medicine there and so on and so forth. We almost won in the Sixth Circuit, but we lost. And so the river died and Nellie and the other remaining farmers got kicked out. Um, but do you see, what's the first law of ecology? Everything's connected to everything else, right? So this is a story that goes not just endangered species, but it talks uh, about e resource economics. It talks about you know uh, history, the uh, environment, environmental justice, the media, the corridors of power in the agencies. And I mean, we were blessed and cursed to have such an amazing case. And, and if I hadn't had such a case and such people, uh, obviously it would have gone nowhere. And it came that close. But America doesn't know about it. And now, when this reaches remainder tables all over America. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's the story, and you're part of it, as I say. Uh, what do you want to do with it? Do you have any questions? Yes. Oh, wait, we have uh, Allison and Ali with mics. All right. Uh, because. <laughs> how did I go? Ooh. <laughs> Sure, you, you be the boss. So, Allie and Allison have microphones. There's, down here, the woman in. Allie, down here. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, what's the status of the snail darter right now? Yeah. Um, we said, you know, we're going to don't move it from its natural uh, spawning beds until we've lost. And then we can try to transplant. It has a life cycle of about two or three years. And so it was transplanted in two other rivers. And the natural population that was there, that was left there, was 25,000. There are now about 25,000 in the two rivers. But they're on life support. Because those rivers, do, do you know in August how a river is much lower? and warmer and less oxygen, so that in August, TVA has to put in bubbles to keep it alive. And I don't know if the House of Representatives thinks the sequester is, but, but the serious point, it's, it, it's alive. Uh, but the best place for a species to survive is its natural habitat. It's only remaining natural habitat. But the right wing says, see, it was not worth anything because we just transplanted it. And that's, that's, that's uh, I, I said, you know, that's like putting gas masks on, on the canary in the coal mine. <laughs> Got it? Actually, put that in the title of an article. <laughs> yes, hi. Um, I want to thank you very much for bringing this story to Portland, Oregon, which thank is you so much supposed for to be me. the... Uh, 
leader in the environmental movement this very week we had a and a good example of the iron triangle happening because there's a bill in congress sponsored by our senator wyden um i think he's republican and uh to uh sell off some forests and log some forests in the coast range western oregon and um so in portland on i think it was tuesday there was a a rally um and they were going to march to senator wyden's office um to um vote no on this and actually the bill was sponsored by our democratic representative defazio and in the oregonian they reported defazio as calling the uh environmentalists that want to save the forests and you know negotiate this issue uh call them radical defazio calls the environmentalists of oregon radical and where we are choosing um to save western oregon forests um over jobs so it's like wonderful that you told us this story of what we're dealing with right today thank you it's it's a poisonous political atmosphere where even Barack Obama feels he has to look more central which ends up being far right when we would have looked at it for for a decade ago but but note the emphasis the, the importance of the media it seems to me the government in the united states uh all five branches has to be approached by citizens with the facts all right five branches right legislative judicial executive media economy or plutocracy or extractive elite or whatever asimoglu called them that's right that uh, extractive elite but but the point is the the fifth one isn't going to budge but if indeed we do it right uh we don't come across as radicals we come across as people who are making sense look at the real benefits look at the real costs look at the real alternatives uh and a clear cutting uh, along the coast is going to give a year or two of bounce to some community but but if you don't do that then you talk about how the economy in Oregon it's no longer timber is no longer the number one industry isn't that right um so you build on it but but when when i started out we never won a single battle uh now um it's really disheartening but there are a lot of laws and there are a lot of citizens and a lot of young people and they're going into the congressional offices and into the agencies and they often know what's going on and do the right thing so i think Well, if you can find a Basio committing adultery that would be helpful too. <laughs> Thank you very much Professor Platter. That was a wonderful presentation. I had two questions. And one sort of a historical one if you could put yourself back when you actually got the species listed. And I'm trying to contrast it with what happens now. Critical habitats are really important part now of how we protect the species and the and the process by which the fish and wildlife service or national marine fisheries service designates critical habitat is a big part i'm assuming this was so early in the esa process that they didn't exactly jump right on a critical habitat it was the first time the critical so, habitat had been so you had to help them define the critical habitat that you were hoping to protect yeah i mean it's almost accidental the way it it's there and so i petitioned to have the fish listed as endangered and then to and, define and the habitat, habitat listed as critical wow. Wow. and i had really wonderful biologists to testify for free obviously uh, so, a number of scientists won't testify because they don't want to look uh uh they don't want to look biased when you testify for industry you're not biased but when you testify for the public you're 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 biased these guys one of them risked his job to testify or to produce evidence and and it went through uh, against oh tva's expert uh Edward Rainey he had been in the court uh case as well he came in in an Armani or well the equivalent suit so then yes he, he was the most eminent ichthyologist in America and yes he had 200 uh, and at Nyerlein's over and he says this is the only ichthyologist who's ever become a millionaire as an ichthyologist <laughs> and, and so uh 
TVA's lawyer says, and isn't it true that this little fish will flourish in a reservoir? And he said, yes, there'll be much more water for it to swim around in. And I said, how could he say that? And Ednar said, in the business, we call these guys biostitutes. Um, but we had good biologists, and the Department of Interior had good biologists who, against the political pressure, pinned it down. And also, they knew that we were going to litigate against them, plus the adulterer threatened to hold hearings if they didn't list the critical habitat. So, so my second question. The, I've worked on the Endangered Species Act for a lot of years, not nearly as many as you, but you've been a hero as I've watched and followed Thank this. Thank you. And so here's my question. Are you actually not a bit surprised how unsuccessful people have been at using the approach of going after legislation to exempt, oh, just exempt my project from consideration. I mean, I almost think it's amazing that it's worked as well as it has and that it hasn't been more often challenged in spite of some incredibly reactive and reactionary politics and, and loathing and it's a great fundraiser for the right to, to overturn the Endangered Species Act. But by God, we still follow it. Yeah. And it's, and you can't. Although it's hanging it. by his finger. Yeah, but, it, but it's hanging. It's not but, falling. And, and also, the National Environmental Policy Act, again, accidentally.
accidentally happened, and there were 800 bills to repeal or amend it. None of them passed. I don't know. Maybe there's a residual fear that Americans would say, mm, that's wrong. I had uh, Howard Baker's hatchet man, Jim Range, uh, the worst lobbyist. Do you know Jim Range? All right. So, so he was in every office before me giving all kinds of false information. He was a one-man wrecking crew. Um, and, and he said, Zig, it's true that Americans really support the Endangered Species Act. And that may be part of it. But it's a mile wide and just an inch deep. And if we show them the Endangered Species Act hurting human welfare, America will turn against not only Endangered Species Act, but other environmental protections as well. You, you saw that from, from the, the homo socialist guys, right? And, and it turns out that if you attack the Clean Air Act, there's grandmother dying on the street, right? If, if you attack the Clean Water Act, people think of you turn on the tap and crud comes out. To, but endangered species, big brown eyes, but there are a lot of things that the biologists name the wrong thing. They, you know, the, the pearly ringed monkey face muscle uh, and, and, and stuff, the, the, what is it, the something hairy spider. And for some reason, um, the environmental movement, which, by the way, was critical in, in, in Washington, if I hadn't had the support of Audubon, of Friends of the Earth and the National Wildlife Federation, I would have been dead. I just, I mean, I, the, 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 I, I was, I'd been fired. Uh, uh, my new dean, however, sent me to Washington and said that would work fine. Uh, I taught two days a week and then three days in Washington. But the citizen environmental groups when there's a moment of crisis, often can get the word out to, to, to head off. And, and so what you see is little administrative changes in the Bush administration or in the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia, who said, what are you talking about? Uh, uh, we're talking humans here, not snail darters. Ha, 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 everybody in the court. All right. So, so, so it's a miracle. But part of it is that the media continues to report this as attacks on the Endangered Species Act. And I don't know. Maybe it's not a mile wide in the inch deep. Maybe it's more than that. Does that mean we're going to... Zig has to sit down? Uh, is it Al here? Or? I have a question. Um, Please feel free to leave if you have to. So my question is that it seems like you latched onto the story of the Hail because... Uh, it related to a story of people and it was where a canary lived, in the coal mine. Where they lived. Uh -huh. um, do you see? Yeah, I think it's you who's making the buzz. <laughs> uh, how do you see the relationship between species conservation or environmental conservation and environmental justice as it relates to people's stories and their sense of place? Um, I don't know exactly how far you want me to go with that. Uh, but it's clear that um, en environmental justice is, is in involved in many cases. It turns out, for instance, that women and uh, men and women of color uh, attract toxics from long distances, uh, that, that communities of low income uh, get hammered. For, so the people there had nothing until, in both cases, for the endangered species and for the environmental impact statement case, young lawyers went in and said, okay, we're going to do this. Um, but in America, you can do that. Only in America could a group of people so lacking in money, in, in power, in tenure, uh, have, have, have carried a case to the very highest levels uh, of, of society. and, and I'm really pleased that EPA has a very active, strong uh, Office of Endangered Species. A Boston College law student was the one who, uh, alum, who, who built it. Um, and environmental justice is something that a lot of people, both law people and non-law people, ha have, have found. But it, you need to pull everything together. But that's it. Scratch away at almost any environmental controversy. 
And pretty much you see soon yourself dealing with big questions of, of democratic governance. Um, now, there was also a question in your mind about place and about species and values. I'm not sure, but, but I said enough on that one, perhaps. Um, you had uh, made several references to being fired. Was that related to you? you uh, was that related to the snail uh, or Was that yeah, retribution? I, or? The old guard felt challenged by the young uh, liberals who had been hired at the University of Tennessee Law School. And if six of the old ones voted against you, it was a black ball and you were out after three years. And I got all six. Uh, and, and one of them said to me, Zig, you've got to realize, you never understood the moderation required of a Tennessee law professor. And he was absolutely right. I mean, it was tough. But, but uh, Joe Sachs, my mentor at the University of Michigan, the father of environmental law, somehow pulled strings. And, and so I got a job uh, at Wayne State in Michigan and met my wife and things were fine. But, but, but yeah. I did not understand the moderation that was required of a Tennessee law professor. I mean, I love Tennessee. I'd still be there 25 minutes from my office. I could be under a waterfall fishing in the Smokies. Uh, well, 35 minutes. Uh, I was there last uh, two weeks ago. Um, and, and all of them have died off except the one <laughs> who said that. Um, so, oh, let, let me read. That night after Jimmy Carter, uh, called, and we were feeling really heartbroken. Um, I was stumbling down the stairs, uh, feeling really horrible. And taped on the wall was, was, was this. I think some of you know where it comes from. One final paragraph of advice. Do not burn yourselves out. Be as I am, a reluctant enthusiast, part-time crusader, a half-hearted fanatic. Save the other half of yourselves and your lives for pleasure and adventure. It's not enough to fight for the land. It's even more important to enjoy it while you can, while it's still here. So get out there and hunt and fish and mess around with your friends. Ramble out yonder and explore the forests. Climb the mountains. Bag the peaks. Run the rivers. Breathe deep of that yet sweet and lucid air. Sit quietly for a while and contemplate the precious stillness the lovely, mysterious, and awesome space. Enjoy yourselves. Keep your brain in your head and your head firmly attached to the body, the body active and alive. And I promise you this much. I promise you this one sweet victory over our enemies, over those desk-bound men with their hearts in a safe deposit box and their eyes hypnotized by desk calculators. I promise you this. You will outlive the bastards. <laughs> Edward Abbey, um, he, he signed his book to me. Dear Zig, we're going to live to piss on their graves. <laughs> I think if people want to come up and talk further. Oh, and, and uh, I have bookmarks that my wife told me. Uh, Yale doesn't have much of a budget for, for marketing. In fact, it's incalculable. Uh, so my wife, and they said I could deduct it from my uh, taxes. Um, so I'm, I'm the budget, for, uh, uh, and I have to become a huckster. But Anne said, make bookmarks. Bookmarks are good. And so this one has a picture of, of the hand and the little fish, and then a picture of the valley that you saw, the aerial shot, and Asa and Mel, and the silos, and some words from Rush Limbaugh. <laughs>